So thank you all so much for coming. I appreciate it. I know there's a ton of other events going on right now. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a little overwhelming, so I really appreciate that you take the time for this. Um, this will be a quite technical session. Um, if at any point you do think that you'd rather want to have a margarita on the roof somewhere, then by all means go, go outside and do that. Uh, I won't be offended, um, but I think this is an important topic. Um, it's a really big topic, so I will do a really high overlevel view of a lot of things that all sound quite complicated, just to get an understanding of like what's the magnitude of ideas that we're dealing with here. I'm not doing this to sound academic. I'm doing this because the topic is hard. I don't want to like dump down the, the concept. It is a really um, important topic, I think, to get right. Um, and I hope that I can interest you enough with this talk um, to at least dig down into some of the readings. Many of you might be already working in the field. Um, that would be delightful. If not, um, maybe you want to. That would be delightful as well. OK, so um, who am I? I'm Alison Dittmann. I'm originally from Germany, but I work at Foresight Institute now in Palo Alto. Uh, my official title is AI safety researcher. I do a bunch of other things too. I moderate a lot of panels, currently a lot on blockchain, um, longevity, long-term thinking in general, um, and a couple of other things too. Um, Foresight Institute is a 30-year-old uh, nonprofit research organization now that is focused on technologies of fundamental importance for the human future especially nanotech, cybersecurity, and AI. We do a lot of longevity uh, stuff as well because um, a good goal of molecular nanotechnology is longevity, or enhanced longevity. Um, I myself, um, it's one of my personal pet peeves. Um, and then I think a lot of blockchain work recently and so far as it pertains to the topic of AI safety. And I know that, you know, like I always joke, 2016 was the year of AI, 2017 was the year of blockchain and cryptocurrency, 2018 we lumped the two together. Um, but there's actually some important uh, and I think interesting ideas that we will discuss later in the readings. Um, okay, so we, what we do at Foresight, we kind of selectively um, advance beneficial technologies. We have a fellowship, we have a prize. Um, the next workshop that we have that's technical is with Nobel Prize laureate Sir Fraser Stoddard coming up in May. I think we still have applications open, so if you work in the field of molecular nanotechnology, by all means apply. This will be a really good workshop. Um, and we also research the risks associated with technologies, especially AI and cybersecurity, um, and those are often via private meetings. The last one that we did was in 2017, and we had people from the EFF, MIRI, OpenAI, um, Google Brain, um, all in one room, and they don't often come together, um, and I thought that was a really valuable event, um, and it, we hope to do it again this year. And then we host, as I mentioned, many salons and um, other events that are open to the public, we had a big conference last year, the Vision Weekend, um, and we're going to have the same again this year. That's going to be in December. Um, if you're in the Bay, um, by all means, please come by. The salons are usually free. Their monthly Vision Weekend is for members only. Um, if you're interested in any of these, go to foresight.org. Um, I'm not sure if everything's updated there, but at facebook.com slash foresightinst, um, we update stuff more regularly. Um, or just write me an email at a at foresight.org. My email address will be on there later as well. Okay, so the topic of today specifically is AI philosophy, why it's hard and state of the art. Most of the readings that we will be discussing are on existentialhope.com. It's a website on which I collect most of the readings that I think are important for, for creating beneficial futures. Um, there, it's a bunch of different readings in a bunch of different fields spanning everything from science and technology to society and economics to predicting and tracking to moral psychology. Um, so I think the whole toolkit I think that we need is on there. Um, it's a collaborative project. I'm not an expert in um, any of those fields really. Um, in the sense that I would like to populate those my, myself. They're Google Docs. Everyone can contribute to them. So please, by all means, contribute the readings that you think are the most important one. You can just write a comment, and I'll add the comment later as a reading. So if you go on existentialhope.com on the session AI and Cyberspace, that's the Google Doc that we will be dealing with in the breakouts. Um, so this talk will, as I mentioned, just be a, a kind of a brush over many different topics. It won't be exhaustive. I will probably have forgotten a lot of really important stuff. And um, this will just like, you know, to be like a small section of like, what might you want to be thinking about when you think about AI safety. I'm hoping that the talk now will be for about an hour. Then there'll be a breakup for about half an hour in which you dig into the readings that I'll be mentioning. 
we'll reconvene, um, we'll discuss, and then in the end I'll tell you about an approach that we've been working on at Foresight that hopes to combine most of the things of what I think is hard about AI safety. Um, okay, so uh, what am I talking about when I say AI safety? I'm talking about artificial general intelligence. So this is any intellect that greatly exceeds the cognitive performance of humans in virtually all domains of interest. That's the, definition, uh, that's the definition that Nick Bostrom gave for superintelligence. There is a difference between AGI and superintelligence. Um, if you're interested in readings um, about this, Luke Mühlhäuser post had a really good blog post about this. It's on the index. I will, for the purposes of this talk, just set the two the same because I think that all the risks that we should be worried about are already present when an artificial intelligence is generally intelligent. I will not discuss whether or not this is likely. I will just postulate this is likely. I will not discuss that it's important when it arrives. It is probably important if it arrives sooner or later, but both of them, um, both of them are dangerous. And there's a good paper called No Fire Alarm for AI Safety by Eliezer Yukowski. If you're interested in those topics, read up on that. I will not discuss near-term AI problems, so something like autonomous weapons or automated research or mimetic warfare. Um, there's a good FHI paper and a good Foresight paper that are on the index if you're interested in those issues. And I will, just n will not discuss whether or not AI will be conscious or not. And there's a paper by David Chalmers that I think is good if you're interested in those matters. Um, also, this will be quite quick. Um, the talk it will be online later as well, so you, if you don't want to take notes all the time, this talk, I will post it on our website so you can have the talk as well. Okay, so the main topic of this talk is um, trying to avoid scenarios like in The Sorcerer's Apprentice, right? Um, does anyone know what I'm talking about? It's a poem that was written by Goethe and that was then picked up by Fantasia. It was basically um, The Sorcerer's Apprentice not wanting to do um, the work um, that, this, that the sorcerer gave him himself, then casting a magic spell on a broom, and then not knowing how to recast that magic spell, the broom getting out of control, and cleaning and cleaning and cleaning and not being able to stop. So we want to avoid scenarios like these in the terms of AI, in which we use a common intelligence um, that we then cannot control afterwards anymore. Um, okay, so what I'm well, going to do now, I'm going to break down AI safety into four different focus areas. I'm going to talk about ethics. Um, this is basically like, what do we want AI to do? It's the content of the goal functions, kind of for me. Right? Then I'm going to talk about the technical alignment. Um, so how do we communicate to an AI what we want them to do? Um, there's a lot of really good work by Miri in that field. Then I'm going to talk about cybersecurity, because even if we would know what we want the AI to do and could communicate this well, we have to make sure that the architecture that the AI is in is safe enough that it reliably executes and that it's not, not um, vulnerable to hacking attacks or something like that. And then I will assume that um, solving one, two, and three would take some time, so we better work on the angle of social coordination and cooperation between the different actors in that field to get it right that not one person races ahead or one um, organization or one nation state races ahead and tries to cut corners in um, all the three other problems that are really hard. All right, let's start with the first one. I will spend a considerable amount of time on the first one, on ethics. This is because I think that it's been neglected in comparison to the other three, and because my background is in philosophy, moral philosophy in particular, so um, it's a background that I have. I will afterwards argue for an approach that hopefully can solve all of them without having to solve all the ethical dilemmas that philosophers have been going on for thousands of years. All right. So I think ethics, in terms of ethics, in terms of AI, it can be broken down into bottom-up and top-down approaches. So how do humans learn moral values, right? I think this is really in, like an interesting approach that you could take here. I think there's bottom-up approaches to how we learn moral values. Those are via evolution and learning and development. And many moral psychologists agree that you know there's at least some kind of developmental aspect of how we get the values that we uphold. And then there's obviously top-down, which is usually moral philosophy. These are moral values like deontology, consequentialism, and virtu virtue ethics. I'm quickly going to go through all of those and through some brief like approaches of how this has actually been trying, uh, trying to be done in the field. And I will point out some technical difficulties here. But my main cl claim will be that even if we were able to implement those approaches, all of them, um, they would still have normative limitations. So they would still not be morally good enough because these AI systems will be so powerful. 
Okay, let's start with um, human nature as moral standards. So this would be the first one, evolution, right? You might say, well, human morality is at least to some sense in, like a result of our evolutionary history. For example, there's many evolutionary game theoretical explanations, um, for example, that try to explain our justice norms of like um, trying to divide 50-50 in resource distribution problems with game theoretical approaches. There's a lot of really interesting work that's being done on that by Brian Skirms, um, by a couple of other researchers that actually try to simulate different players that are self-interested in evolutionary environments and show that no matter how self-interested they are, they will actually always reach a 50-50 split, or like that would that at least be the dominant strategy over time. And then they say, well, basically we could explore, uh, explain our justice norms in, term of, in terms of these 50-50 splits, that this is a rational thing to do. So evolution at least is like some kind of exp explaining factor in our current justice norms. So then you might think, well, easy. Uh, if we could just simulate evolution in an artificial environment, the players or like the AIs that we are building might then automatically have the same um, moral values that we do. And this has actually been trying to do in, like, in, this, in the sense of learning. So this is ES, it's an evolutionary, uh, it's a, called evolutionary strategy and it's a field of robotics. This is a paper that OpenAI published in 2017 um, where they basically, basically use this evolutionary strategy to solve three-dimensional humanoid walking in 10 minutes. This is really fast. And um, they obtain competitive results with other deep learning strategies, right? So you could, you might really be able to think that these evolutionary strategies of just having, like, uh, simulating these evolutionary environments, like these checkerboards, and having the agents figure it out on themselves, um, might be a good strategy to do. I think the difference between teaching an, a an AI or an agent how to walk and how to learn moral values is significant, right? I think our justice norms, for example, are bigger than just trying to like split 50-50 in resource distribution problems. Like we have problems of intergenerational justice, we have problems of procedural justice. So I think there's some technical difficulties because our evolutionary history is not a checkerboard, right? We've gone through a lot of cultural and structural evolutionary scenarios as well, and it would just be really hard to simulate such an environment. That being said, I think even if we could, there is this normative problem that I think we cannot overcome in the, st in the same sense that many of the norms that we uphold might be due to evolutionary artifacts. Like evolutionary psychology also shows that our evolution makes us prone to many biases, right? That we don't want to be upholding. So there's a range of biological biases which are normatively problematic. One of them is the Cinderella bias. Um, who has heard of the Cinderella bias? It's basically where like you favor your, your your own offspring to that of like of um, a parent that like where you have not given birth to that offspring, or like where you're not genetically um, where you don't have a genetic stake in that offspring, um, and this is for evolutionary reasons. So that's like the you know like the Cinderella stepmother, basically, and that has an evolutionary effect. So many of the biases that we think are not moral can also be explained potentially by our evolutionary past. Especially, for example, there's a lot of studies that there's differences in jealousy behavior between men and women, and that is prone to our evolutionary past. So it's kind of interesting because it would mean that if we simulated an AI, depending on whether we simulate um, a female or a male AI, it would then have very different moral norms, right? So these are, I think, interesting toy problems, but they still bring home for me that idea that simulating, uh, that evolution is just not good enough to simulate moral norms. Um, then you might say, okay, evolution does not have to be good enough. How about just literally teaching an AI the values that we uphold? So the way that you know, children learn moral values um, is by socialization, right? We teach them as parents and we teach them in schools and we might be able to do the same um, with AI systems as well. Um, there are a couple of technical dif difficulties, of course, um, but you might say, well, there are some neural net nets that already learn pretty good um, by just by, by punishment and reward functions. So we might be able to do the same with AI systems. And um, because sometimes y humans learn by punishment and reward, they s slowly learn you know, norms in society. Well, there is a problem, <laughs> which is that we in our society have not figured out the perfect moral norms that we, are, like, that we give our, our kids, right? In school and, and even as parents not, right? We are prone to so many different biases that we know or do not know about their culture, their racial, and I think if we like knowingly or even unconsciously 
Um, if we are affected by these discriminatory discriminative biases, like raising an AI in those environments will also make them prone to the same biases. There's a really big problem right now in AI literature of algorithmic bias, and this is basically when um, AIs function on data and that data is um, already skewed, um, that, and then the algorithms have the same skewage of the data. So it's like biased data will lead to biased AIs, and biased AIs might then you know, lead into that feedback loop where humans that are are kind of faced by those biases, make even more biased decisions that will then generate new data that will again go into those AI systems. An interesting example is Microsoft Tai. Who has heard of Microsoft Tai? Great, okay, cool. That was a chatbot um, and that Microsoft basically released onto Twitter um, and that was like learning on other people's Twitter data. It was basically retreating and it's more a toy problem, but here you can see how it turned from just like one day, I think it was, from a human-loving um, AI into like uh, a Hitler-supporting um, rager on Twitter, right? So what you get in is what you get out. Because we're not morally perfect yet, um, what we will get put in will also not um, bring out morally perfect results. Another one that is maybe more um, relevant here, because this is more a toy example, right, is, uh, for example, risk assessment algorithms for prison sentences. Because our prisons are already Filled, um, uh, because the normal way that we reach prison sentences is already racially biased, one might argue, right? Um, an algorithm that kind of relies on the data to make new prison sentences and risk assessments will also be skewed. Um, another problem, of course, is that many people that are working on AI are white males in Silicon Valley. So that diversity um, is another lag there that I think will just inherently skew the in input bias in a way that we won't get unbiased systems or unbiased norms out of it. Okay, so these are the kind of approaches that I talked about that are bottom up, right? If we just try to nurture by evolution or by moral, by moral learning in AI the same way that we've learned, maybe we get it moral. I wanted to argue that we don't because we are not inherently moral. So maybe let's look to top-down approaches in moral philosophy, right? They've been talking about this for over a thousand years. So maybe they have a better approach of how to get actually morality into an agent. I don't think so. Um, let's look at deontology, for example, as a moral standard. So deontology um, is kind of this approach um, and is a really vast feed, field, right? I'll just brush over it. It's the rules-based approach to morality and it basically says that an action is morally right if it's done from duty or in accordance with a moral law or laws. Um, who has heard of Asimov's laws of robotics? Okay, everyone here, right. So most of Asimov's like stories here, right, they rely on the fact that those rules are in conflict with each other, right? If you don't have weight, like weights on your rules, then these rules will conflict with each other and you have to like basically define every single situation that might possibly pop up in the whole world, in the whole of, of, of the future, um, to find a way of how moral laws will not conflict in the same sense that Asimov's laws conflicted in Asimov's stories, right? Um, but you might say, well, Asimov is a pretty primitive example of deontology, right? <laughs> and that's true. So let's look at Kant's categorical imperative, right? <laughs> the gold standard, really, for moral philosophy in terms of deontology. If you haven't heard about it, I'm not going to go down into Kant's rabbit hole. Um, there are many books written about, about his categorical imperative. Just here, really quickly, here's basically two two mechanisms of how to find out whether an action is permissible or not. One is only act according to a maxim that one could coherently wish to be a universal law or always treat humanity as an end in itself. And those are already quite a mouthful, right? Um, and someone has actually gone through this formidable task of how to try to put Kant's categorical imperative into a system of computational logic. Um, and I'm, I'm sure he had a lot of fun with this. Tom Powers is his name. I'm, I'm linking to a paper written by him on the index. Um, and this is um, the, the image there is kind of like a way of how, to, how, do, how he tries to put Kant's categorical imperative into computational logic. Um, the problem, of course, it is, is that where C represents a circumstance, um, and the problem is, of course, that it assumes this kind of like problem of background knowledge, right? If we want to see here if a maxim is universalizable or not, 
we have to describe something, right? So if I want to see whether lying can be universalized or not, I could either say, well, lying is a thing in itself. Is that universalizable? Maybe not. But lying at 6, uh, 6 p.m. on this and this date in this and this circumstance, that by, might be universalizable and so permissible. So like describing the situation and seeing whether um, a law can be universalizable or not already requires this n like background knowledge of morally relevant factors in a situation. And so this would already require an AI to have some inherent moral knowledge anyways that would be really hard to implement. So this would be just a technical limitation. But I think even more so than that, and I think this is the really crux of the matter, what moral philosophy has not really been, been, really been, been up to, to challenging sufficiently, is that there is other normative insufficiencies. For example, some deontological rules could be just post-rationalizations of morally irrelevant evolutionary cause intuitions. So just like many of our biases that we have on like, you know, that we had in the fir first and second one, are already just like morally ir irrelevant evolutionary intuitions that we act on. I think even the, the kind of, like even what we, we act on so many things and afterwards we just post-rationalize them with many of those supposedly deontological rules, right? And many of them might not actually be really rules-based, but might just be post-rationalizations of our actions. And a really good way to, um, to show this, uh, which many of you have probably heard much enough about, are the trolley dilemmas. Who here has not about the trolley dilemmas? Okay, has not heard about the trolley dilemmas. Okay, so please Google trolley dilemmas, go on the internet, look at all of those memes. I've done over 127 papers on moral trolley dilemmas. They are basically ridiculous ways of how to debunk different, um, different theories. So it basically says that if you take this trolley problem, right, um, then in this thought experiment, there's these two versions of it where most people would agree to save five people by redirecting a fatal threat, in this case a trolley, that is hurling towards one single individual. In this case, most people say, yep, yeah, we do this, we save the five. But on the other hand, most people would not do this if it would involve pushing a fat man off the bridge. They'd say, nope. And most people say that this is because um, of Kantian's point, or like of this deontological rule that you should not treat the man, you know, in this case as a means to save the five, um, because in this case, oh, you would, um, con you would like, you would uh, inflict an up close personal push harm, um, but here in this case it's okay because you, you wouldn't really be using the man as a means in the first case, right? So many people have these post-rationalization of the actions, why it's actually okay to, like, to flip the switch but to not push the man, and they oftentimes have, um, or they oftentimes argue for this with those deontological rules, that in this case it's not okay to inflict personal harm, for example, right? But many people now in more psychology literature have been revisiting those trolley problems and have been pointing out, Peter Singer was one of them, Jonathan Haidt was one of them, that the real reason for the aversion against pushing the man off the bridge is caused by an aversion against causing physical harm. And this aversion is, com is coming from our evolutionary past in which we could only inflict harm by pushing or by really inflicting harms with our hands. So we have this evolutionary intuition against pushing which might not actually have any moral, moral significance. So we just have this emo emotive reaction against, no, it's wrong to inflict this, this upfront harm, but actually even though the rational thing might still be to cause this upfront personal harm to save the five. But evolutionarily, we don't get it into our heads. We, we just have this aversion against pushing the man, and afterwards we kind of post-rationalize it by saying that it's the, this deontological rule against pushing. Um, so this is usually used to debunk deontology, right? Well, and this is usually used by utilitarians who say we should always try to save the five in these scenarios, right? Whether or not we have an aversion against it, we should always try to save the five. So then look, let's look at utilitarianism and let's see whether utilitarianism actually has a better offer for AI, say, or for AI morality. Well, according to utilitarianism, an action is right not according um, to the agent's compliance with abstract rules, but according to the outcomes of the actions, right? 
So according to act utilitarianism, for example, an action is right if it maximizes overall utility. That's often defined as well-being or preference satisfaction. So there are some ways of how to implement that potentially into an AI, and I'm linking to some on the index. But there are also some technical limitations, again, to describe the action and to, like, to calculate what well-being ultimately cause, is being caused by an action would just require defining a situation in a way that is really problematic for an AI to define without any more pre-knowledge. Um, but I think regardless of that, there's, all, again, these normative limitations, right? So again, some tendencies to even use utilitarian reasoning could, one might argue, be post-rationalizations of morally irrelevant evolutionary cause intuitions. Right? There's many studies, studies that have been done on, for example, the reflexive effects of policies that suggest that sometimes, because we're in, in this capitalist environment, we're so prone to this homo economicus way of always cost-benefit cost, uh, cost maximizing that we morally wrongly apply this to moral situations where we actually, where there's actually might be some rights at stake. In the trolley di dilemma here then, um, utilitarians would say, yep, to both, ca both cases, you should both times just really try to save the five because it maximizes well-being. But one might argue here that the tendency to save the greater number could be the result of falsely applying this normative, normatively irrelevant benefit maximizing analysis from economics to a moral environment where it has nothing to do, right? Where we might have some rules. So it's really quite crazy. It's been like, there's a lot of literature that has recently been coming out on evolutionary psychology, on evolutionary bias literature, um, that basically go back and forth between trying to debunk these evolutionary like aversions to things there's um, uh, Joshua Green and some others at Harvard have been putting people in brain scanners and actually showing which parts of their brain light up when they make um, when they make decisions, trying to suggest that sometimes it is really this more emotionally intuition, um, and sometimes we act more rationally. So there's a lot of literature out there. A link to all of the literature from the index if you're actually interested in moral philosophy. But anyways, just check out all of the trolley problems. It's quite crazy. There is a bunch of literature on there. Um, some of them are really ridiculous with Pokemons in there, with the ship of Theseus trolley problem, with the hedonist trolley problem, where there's, a, where there's a loop afterwards, and loops are fun, so maybe it's even funner. And they're obviously all memes, right? So there's this crazy meme literature on poly problems. So there is definitely this kind of like ab absurdist way of using debunking to debunk other debunking explanations. So take it with a grain of salt, right? I'm just using these because I think there are actually, I think it's actually a problem that moral philosophy faces right now that it doesn't really answer yet. And for moral philosophy in university, we really don't really answer to most of those, like um, to most of those objections to moral philosophies. And I think moral philosophies have to wake up and take these really into account. Anyways, moving on to AI safety. Um, the last approach really was virtue ethics um, in moral philosophy. And, um, and many of you have probably heard of Aristotle, right, and his cardinal virtues. Um, and this approach is really about like what makes a person moral is not about the action that they take in any given situation, of whether they follow a rule or maximize uh, happiness, but it's about building a morally stable character. Um, so Aristotle has these virtues of prudence and, and etc. Eric Weinstein has a couple of virtues that I think are good there. It's like a moral take on like truth, fitness, meaning, and grace. And then Sam Harris, who of you have heard of Sam Harris? Yeah, he has written the book on moral landscape. He is quite consequentialist and utilitarian, but I think there's a way of how you could see the moral landscape that he's written in a way of like, you want to always maximize um, the type of like the, the type of moral actions over the long run. So maybe having a character that inhibits certain moral value is just the best way to do this. Um, actually, people are at Berkeley now trying an approach that is, could at least be cast in that way. It's called inverse reinforcement learning for AI. And it's basically the process of deriving a reward function of an agent um, from observed behavior. So a robot would literally observe a person's behavior to figure out what the goal that that behavior seems to be trying to achieve is, and then trying to act on this goal. And Stuart Russell, um, who is one of the, I think, best known AI researchers, he kind of stated that inverse reinforcement learning might be, uh, might be used so that robots can observe humans and attempt to codify 
kind of complex ethical values in an effort to create a robot that kind of learns like not to cook your cat without you actually having to, having to tell it, but with it just it observing you, right? So this kind of like stable character of you not cooking your cat will eventually um, tell the robot that this is just a thing that you shouldn't do. So these more stable character values. Well, I think um, a big problem is that a normative limitation is that, again, in experimental psychology, there's this new field of situationism that kind of shows that um, you can better predict, predict a person's behavior in many situations, not according to the character that they supposedly have, but according to really normatively irrelevant cues. For example, if I was grading an exam of you guys, you could better predict the grades that I'd be giving you by whether or not there is a bin with um, grossly smelling food right next to me that would um, kind of like make my grades, like make me downgrade the grades that I'd be giving you rather than by me actually rationally grading you. And there's a lot of studies that have shown that this actually works. So judges, when they're hungry, give more prison sentences and so on and so forth. So rather than like showing a stable character, we are often influenced by really tiny things in our situation environment that we often not, not really known. So this might be a problem with AI safety because it would mean that we don't really act reliably, which would make it really hard for an AI to observe us and then to act reliably according to our character. So in summing up the first point right about AI ethics, like why is AI ethics hard? AI ethics is hard because human ethics is hard, right? We have not figured it out yet. We, like moral philosophers, have been on it for over a thousand years, and now with this whole experimental psychology literature that has come out, and with actually people um, being able to do brain scans, um, it's just been becoming harder and harder, and there's no consensus being reached yet, right? To me, kind of ethics seems more and more to be this ongoing negotiation between like which evolutionary artifacts in our head we want to call values and which we can't want to call biases. And I think we are making progress along the way, but we're not there yet. I think that in a hundred years from now, we will look back and many of the kind of now current practices we will think of as amoral, right? I think we might be able to predict some more progress. I think that our approach to animal suffering might be one that where we realize that this is relying on an in-group bias or on a species' bias soon. So I think we are making progress, but it's really slow and we're not there yet. And I think just enshrining our current values into an AI system would not get us very far. I think um, those are all really hard moral questions, but I think they're worth answering because I think if we get AI morality right, we could learn a lot because less biased AI systems might teach us a thing or two about how it is to be less biased. But it is a really, really hard problem. And there's a lot of good readings that I'll point to in a little bit. But this is a hard problem, and this is only one of many, right? This is only the ethical content. So I will I spend a considerable amount of time on this. I will not spend that much time on all the other three. I will slowly go over them. This is not supposed to, to mean that I think that they're less relevant. This is only because, as I said, my background is in ethics, and I actually think the ethics part is a little bit neglected right now. Um, but I'll brush over the others and I'll definitely point out readings. They are all on the existential hope index list. So let's move to technical alignment. Technical alignment is really the question of like, if we knew what our values were, how would we implement them in an AI? Um, and there is a thing called, and you've seen with the source of the apprentice, it's like we want the AI to do what we want, right? Not what we say, because we just, we, we are kind of morally imperfect and in this state where we don't really know what we ultimately wanted. And there is this orthogenality thesis in AI that basically says that an AI can have any combination of intelligence level and goal. And this is a really important one because it can lead to value misalignment. So it could be that an AI system can be incredibly competent at achieving a goal that is really not what we want. So who here has, heur has heard of the paperclip maximizer? Right? Many of you have heard of it. It's basically a thought experiment in which an AI has, for one reason or another, as a goal to maximize paper clips. Um, and it is so ins it's very competent at this goal. It's doing it really well. In fact, it's doing it so well that it tiles up the whole universe with paper clips and transforms everything around it, across it, into paper clips. It's very competent, but it's definitely not aligned with our goals. So um, even if we could get that end goal right, of like that, and even if we could avoid something like a paperclip maximizer, 
there's many instrumental values in an AI that even... Okay. Yeah. Even if we got the end goal right of AI safety, right? Even if we could, could install an end goal and if we could reliably execute it, there's also instrumental values. So there's this theorem of no coffee when you're dead. An AI can't bring you coffee when it's dead. So an AI has this inherent drive to stay alive, right? It's this inherent survival drive. Um, and it, it's probably also better to have more resources to bring you what you want. So these are two values that no matter what goal you give it, it probably wants to stay alive. So it probably has this aversion against being shut off. And it probably wants to acquire more resources. Um, Steve Mohundro calls these the basic AI drives. And they might be pretty, um, well, to say the least, pretty difficult if you would eventually um, have not created the perfect moral system and you'd like to shut it off. Well, I think that all of this being said, there is a really interesting post written by Eliezer Yukowski, who is a really, really good writer on AI. Um, you should totally check him out if you haven't heard of him. And he basically says that all technical alignment is so hard that we should start small. Uh, and this is his strawberry example. We should set the goal low. He basically says that most of the difficulty in AI alignment is already contained in making, a in making strawberries from scratch that is similar, that making one strawberry from scratch that is similar to real strawberry at the cellular level without destroying the universe. And he says this contains most problems in AI safety. Even though you'd think, well, this doesn't really contain any ethical problems because there's no trolley problem in it or it doesn't really have, have an ethical goal. But there's, again, many of those instrumental values and how an AI might go about creating strawberries that are inherently in conflict with our survival, right? It might, um, it might just assume that the best way of creating strawberries is to create all humans into resources to create strawberries or by creating fences around the strawberries and, shutting and, and preventing itself from being shut off. So the same situation like the paperclip maximizer could arise from those strawberries just because it does not know all the other things that we might not want it to do in order to create strawberries. Um, and this sounds very sci-fi, but it is actually really hard, right? And I encourage you to, to check out MIRI, the Machine Intelligence Research Institute on this. Um, all of the organizations and readings um, that I'm referencing, referencing are at existentialhope.com under the section AI and cyberspace. Please check them out. Um, and then I think even if we got the technical alignment right, we, can, we come to the um, topic, the third one of cybersecurity, right? Even if we knew what kind of like goal content we'd want an AI to have, like what the ethics would be, and even if we knew how to actually align an AI with our goals, we, would re we cannot expect an AI to reliably execute our, the desired goal without proof that the hardware and the software that the AI is using is provably safe. And there's three possible fail failure modes for cybersecurity and AI. And many people don't often connect cybersecurity and AI, but I think they're inherently connected. And we've written a lot of papers on this connection, and they're all on the index as well. But I think the main failure modes of how an AI might fail in terms of cybersecurity are hackers, bugs, and exploit. Of course, malicious hackers could gain access to the system and sabotage or reprogram an AI. And given the immense advantage that an artificial intelligent agent would actually convey on its owners, the threat of a cybersecurity attack is probably just increasing over time. Um, the, the second problem is an unintentional bug. And this bug could disturb the AGI's goal execution, so it could not make it not reliably execute the goal function or goal functions. And why this problem may seem small in our current AI systems, given like the immense kind of like spread of the um, of the AI's um, just the immense spread of the AI problem domain, um, this might be a really important problem on the long run. And then of course exploits, and this is potentially a more sci-fi scenario for some of you, which is basically that an AI G AGI could discover and exploit its own vulnerabilities in its own code and could reprogram itself in an unintended dangerous way or by breaking it out and connecting it to the internet in case it's a confined AI. And all of these three seem pretty important. So let's look at where we're standing in terms of cybersecurity currently. <laughs> well, um, let's look at software first. In 2015, right, um, Symantec discovered 
just one new zero-day attack per week. This is one new zero-day attack per week, and this is twice more than in 2014. This is an incredibly big amount of zero-day attacks, right? And this is twice more than in 2014, so this means that now in 2018 is probably even much higher, right? But it's really hard to find good numbers on it because there's no incentive really of companies to publish how often they've had an, 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 a vulnerability exploit, right? So it's really hard, hard to find good numbers. There's probably a lot of more, more cyber attacks happening than we know about because they're not being disposed or they're not being enclosed. So the numbers are probably really high. Currently, I think companies have enough money to fix the loopholes, but they all rest on an insecure foundations. And this is a big problem that I think is really hard to tackle. Um, even if we got the software right, we have the hardware problem. <laughs> and this is really just a hardware supply problem, uh, supply chain problem, really. Um, you've all heard of the Snowden revelations, right, in 2018 of, like, the NSA basically forcing with national security letters Intel and AMD to install trapdoors or like backdoors into their systems that they could trigger and could gain access to um, many US citizens' in, um, information. Um, and this was in 2018. It's probably much worse now in 2000. Uh, sorry, that was in 2013. It's probably much worse in 2018. We have not really fixed it. There has not really been a public outcry that was big enough that there has been any real good attempt at solving this issue. Also, the NSA is probably on our side, or supposedly so, but now we have China too, right? And this is a problem because China has a really big incentive of establishing trapdoors in, in, in our systems, and we do get most of our hardware from China, um, and this will not change in the future. So in terms of a race, which I'm going to now in the next point, in terms of race dynamics between two nation states like China and the US, China really has a big incentive to install trapdoor in the hardware that it ships us um, and then to, like, to exploit that, uh, that vulnerability in, in our hardware once it comes to race dynamic between the US and China. This is not often talked about, um, but I think it's, um, it's just logical and it is probably a bigger problem that we want to admit. So given that number one, the ethics, number two, the technical, and number three, the cybersecurity aspect, take a lot of time to fix and are really hard problems. Um, I think it's really important to get social coordination um, right in terms of having the different players in the field cooperate. Because figuring out all of the three above, the ethical contact, technical alignment and security could take some time. Some of the work might best be done later in time when we actually know the type of systems that we're building and that would make it really useful to be able to stop before we hit AGI and to coordinate and cooperate. And this requires social coordination between the different players involved. Who are the different players involved? Well, I think there's different ways to split it up. Um, there are definitely divisions according to nation state lines. There are divisions according to ty the types of organizations or to ideological closeness. But I think two great powers that will emerge regardless, no matter what, are probably like divisions that are US or like-minded allies, for example, the UK, Japan, and Israel, and then Asian actors, for example, China. And I think avoiding races between those powers that would incentivize corner cutting on ethics, technical alignment, and cybersecurity is a really hard problem. But it's a problem that we can work on right now, right? Like we, we already know the types of players that are probably involved in this field, so we can already work on making cooperation between those players more likely than not. Um, and the problem with avoiding AGI races in terms of other races are that I think there's three distinct things that make this particularly hard, right? One is it takes two to not abide. So let's say even if China and uh, the US were cooperating, if Russia wasn't and would cut corners on the other safety aspects, then it might get there first. So there's even if one player doesn't abide and if the others all are, this is a big problem. Then there's this first mover advantage, right, to cut corners and to reach AI first and to not abide in co cooperating between the players. And this advantage will be there potentially forever. So even if players cooperate for 10 years, right, and even if we think we're pretty safe, we have like cooperation treaties in place and so on, 
in the eleventh year, someone might be close enough that it's actually rational then for them to defect. So this problem is really hard and it's not going to go away very easily. And then <laughs> this is, I think, a thing that um, is, is makes it especially hard is that AGI cooperation is not your usual prisoner's dilemma, right? In the Cold War, you had a prisoner's dilemma, but at least in terms of nuclear weapons, you know the outcome, right? We know what happens if parties use nuclear weapons. Right? We know it f sufficiently well, and we know the damage that is being done. But AI, because of the inherent kind of like insecurity or uh, of the inherent um, of the, this inherent potentially very positive outcome for one player, and of this inherent unpredictability of what an artificial general intelligence might actually be like, we don't even know the payoffs. So the payoffs are conflated. So this makes it even harder in terms of prisoner's di dilemmas. It's not even your actual prisoner's dilemmas in which you could map the playoff and then have like game theorists try to, f try to work on it. You first have to figure out what's the actual payoff here. Um, so you might think that these are theoretical problems, but we're a pretty cooperative bunch, right, in the world. Well, let's look at the reality here. How cooperative are we? China just came out that it wants to be the leader in AI in 2025 and it has put significant resources um, towards that goal. They are, um, yeah, significant. Um, and there has been an article recently written um, on China using AI for its military purposes, and then the Pentagon responding and being very concerned, suggesting that the military race at least is on. So this has been like a development that has occurred in the last year, um, or that, that has at least accelerated in the last year. So this is a problem that is just getting worse and it's just getting started. Um, but it's also a problem that we can work on because we know the problem area, right? We know game theory areas, we know cooperation areas, we know um, that how, to, how, how we've struck in cooperative bands in the past and we might be able to do it in the future. So if you're working in the government, if you're working in any of those organizations, cooperation and, uh, in, in terms of safety is one that might actually be one that is really important on the short run, and that is one that uh, we at least have some idea of how to tackle it. Then the related dichotomies here that are interesting in the field, if you want to check them out, there's papers on it on the index, are unipolar versus multipolar player scenarios. So is it better if only two, um, if there's only two big players, or is it better if there's a lot of different players working on AI? And then openness versus closeness. So there's open AI, right, um, that are supposedly um, sharing, I think, most of their research openly, but even they have that at least policy that um, they, don't, they don't say that they're actually always going to follow through with it um, in terms of if they realize that it might be at one point dangerous enough to share all, all of their resources openly, they might um, divert from that openness to a more closed setting. So I think openness in terms of even research setting, I have an inherent bias, I think, to openness. I think usually open source is amazing. Um, in AI safety, I realize that this might be a bias that potentially is not good, um, but this is a problem that um, we have discussed at the recent AI meeting. If you're interested, come talk to me about it. I would still love to see us being as open as possible for as long as possible. So I think generally, um, if there are any questions, um, we could take like one or two now before I would like to go through the different, into the session where you actually work together as a group for half an hour. Um, if you have one or two questions that are burning right now, then um, please raise your hand. So what I'd like to do in this second part now is I've basically given you like a spiel of like why is AI safety hard, right? What are the four different problem domain areas that you might be working on? And what I would like to do now is at least for half an hour is that you pick one of those four. You pick like the ethics problem, you pick the technical alignment problem, or you pick the cybersecurity problem or the cooperation problem. And then you um, go into like one of the different rooms. So the ethics problem will be here, the technical alignment problem will be here, the cooperation problem will be here, and uh, the cybersecurity problem will be there. You pick one of those um, problems that you want to work on and you go through the literature actually and try to see whether there is something that at least might tell you how hard the problem is um, and whether you find something that is I think an interesting enough case where you think that you have some comparative advantage that you could actually come up 
with something that might be helpful here or you have literature advice that is good in that area. So there is a lot of state-of-the-art research in terms of ethics. There's a really good, on the, and that's all on the index. If you go on existentialhope.com under AI and cyberspace, under ethics, there is the value alignment, alignment landscape that is by the FLI. There's EthicsNet, um, that where you can hit play. Um, this has now, this has now been transformed into an actual, um, into an actual company that uh, that you can support. Then there's the Humans Consulting, Humans Consulting, Humans, um, that is by Paul Cristiano, really good paper. And then there's Odd. This is a new nonprofit that has been, that has been found on improving human deliberation via AI. There's Neuralink, which you've might heard of, that is from Elon Musk, trying to basically create, create a wizard head of making us smarter so that we can figure out this problem. There is an AI as ethicist approach, um, which is on using natural language programming on academic literature. There is Eliza Yukowski's coherent extrapolated volition, which I think is would be the ultimately best approach to AI safety if we could get around it. And then there is supermoral AI. Um, which is a paper by Neil Watson. Then there is, in terms of technical alignment, FLI has posted an AI safety research landscape. It's a really cool landscape. It's a conceptual map. You basically zoom in into this map and you can go and see what different fields are involved in te technical alignment. Then we have an alignment, why it's hard and where to start. This is a talk by Eliezer Yukowski with a lot of really good resources. Then we have Directions and Desiderata for AI Alignment by Paul Cristiano. And um, Nate Suarez has the ensuring that smarter than human intelligence has a positive outcome. We have Prosaic AI by Paul Cristiano, Learning from Human Preferences by Stuart Russell, and AI AGIS Corporations, which is a paper that Peter Shire wrote on a grant for Paul Cristiano, who is now a Foresight Fellow. It's a really neat approach because it uses the way that we treat corporations already as a way that we might be one of treating super intelligences. Um, in terms of cybersecurity, which is, a, I think, a field that's super interesting, we have AGI timelines and policy. There's a cybersecurity section there. We have cyber nano and AGI risk, which is a paper that I co-authored with Christine Peterson and Mark Miller. And we basically have a section on the blockchain ecosystem as role model for security. We have another paper on cybersecurity and AI, AI alignment and security, and a couple of other papers that I think are just really good in terms of figuring out the cybersecurity aspect. And then ultimately, in terms of cooperation and coordination, there's a good reading guide on there by Miles Bundage. There's AGI timelines and policy. So this is the white paper of the workshop that I referenced that I was hosting for Foresight Institute last year. And there's a section on coordination and big powers. So that's like an overall approach of why AI safety is hard. Um, then we have smart policies for AI, a guide to working in AI, and an intelligence distillation. And then there's a blockchain thinking approach, which is, which is a little bit more futuristic. So what I'd love you to do is now for like the next 20 minutes is to really assemble in like small groups so we're going to have the ethics group here. We're going to have the technical alignment group here. We're going to have the cybersecurity group there. And we're going to have the social coordination group in that area of the room. And where you can dig in those readings or just talk to your peers about like, what you have learned from that session before I'll then talk about the actual approach to AI alignment that we've come up with, which I think solves all of the, the four in a sufficiently good way. All right. So from now on, 20 minutes, um, if you'd like to assemble in the groups, again, ethics here, technical alignment here, cybersecurity there, and social coordination there. Great. 20 minutes from now on, and then we discuss in the big group. Here is an alternative approach that we have discussed in a paper um, that is also on the index. It is called um, the well, it is called Cyber Nano AGI Risk: Decentralized Approaches to Reducing Risks. Um, we wrote this for the for the UCLI Risk Risk Colloquium um, that was last year, and it is basically proposes that we decentralize the danger. Um, so while traditional AI safety approaches kind of assumes that create this novel non-human super intelligence right that serves human interest. 
we create that we should make an AI part of the existing superintelligence, which is civilization, because civilization already serves our interests. This sounds kind of a mouthful, so let me explain. Um, I think traditional AI safety kind of postulates that the AI will perform this unitary takeover, and then AI safety tries to make that AI that takes over serve human interests. And as we've seen, I think in number one, that's a really hard problem, right? So serving what, what, or finding out what, 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 is, what does it mean to serve human interests is a problem that philosophy has grappled with for a while. And even if we did agree on what models to implement, we'd still need to find a way of how to actually enshrine them into the AI. So I think that rather than putting these really hard questions between us and safety, we should seek to enshrine the emerging AI as we um, kind of develop it into the existing system of civilization in a decentralized fashion because this system is already super intelligent and it already serves our interests fairly well. This kind of, of course, relies on the premise that civilization is already super intelligent. And that is a claim, I think, um, that is kind of hard to wrap your head around, but I think ultimately taking as a whole civilization can be seen as a super intelligence. It is vastly more intelligent than any individual. It is already composed of both human and machine intelligences, and its intelligence is already increasing at an exponentially accelerating rate. How is it intelligent? Well, just like you can use an intelligence test to test the intelligence of an individual, um, there might be a way to measure society's intelligence by its ability to achieve its goals, given the resources provided by the humans. There's an interesting paper that was written, part of the Egoric papers, by Miller and Drexler in 1988. It's linked to from the index. It's an old paper, but it, and Marvin Minsky's Society of Mind concept is a similar concept that would evoke such a thinking. So if you're interested in how civilizations can be super intelligent, then the, this is good literature to go to. But um, let's assume that civilization can be super intelligent, or that at least that's a definition that we can uphold. How does that um, say, how does that safety approach fare on like ethics, on technical alignment, cybersecurity, and cooperation? Really quickly. So I think that um, in terms of ethics, um, it tries to solve us by just saying that civilization is already serving human interests, right? So we dodged the bullet of having to solve AI ethics by relying on civilization to evolve in a way that it really serves human interests. So of course civilization as a whole doesn't want anything. It has no utility function in itself, like an AI would, but it does have a tropism. So it tends to grow into certain directions. And to the extent really that civilization emerges from these non-coercive, non non-violent voluntary interactions between humans, it is already shaped by human values. So it tends to imperfectly at least climb Pareto preferred paths. And not every interaction right now that we see is beneficial for everyone involved, of course, but I think human institutions over time have evolved over many thousands of years that tend to shape the interactions to be mutually voluntary and in the interest of both parties. It's not perfect, but we've survived so far and it's the best we can do. And I think if you agree that civilization is already serving human interests, Let's rely on this mechanism and try to enshrine an emerging AI into it. And the way you do that in terms of technical alignment is, I think, to install this system of checks and balances amongst different entities. And Drexler had this quote. It's again quite old, but the Agoric papers are really some worth revisit revisiting between Drexler and Miller, where he says, the examples of memes controlling memes and of institutions controlling institutions also suggest that AI systems can control AI systems. And so the idea here is we need to create many decentralized instantiations of the superintelligence that serve different ends. And these ends should be best served by cooperation. So rather than creating one unitary AGI, we should use the technological ability that it would take to do this to create many non-cursive entities of that superintelligence in the world. And these entities can then take part in like this in as interactive agents in the already existing fabric of civilization. Um, and they can be employed by different parties simultaneously, and they should be serving many different ends. So just like humans already not only interact with humans, but already with software agents, we might in the future just be interacting with software agents that are much more intelligent than that, and there are structures for that in place. I think it ultimately doesn't matter what type of agents interact with each other, as long as these agents are bound into a system of checks and balances with each other. 
And what are some examples of this? Well, there's the power division in the US constitutions. This is a system of, set of checks and balances that has been working, at least in civilization, fairly well. Um, and then in terms of an actual technical approach to this, check out object capabilities approach to computer security. Um, this is an approach that already um, um, relies on human and artificial agents to interact with each other. It's written by Mark Miller, who's a Foresight Fellow, um, and it's linked to from the index. And I think ultimately, if you would accept that, you know, we can align AIs into our civilization system, how we would solve cybersecurity um, is, now blockchain comes into the game, um, is with this approach of hostility breeds security. So currently, of course, our civilizational ecosystem that we have, as I pointed out, is really not secure, right? But it can be. And I think a good role model for this is the blockchain ecosystem. Um, and we might be able to perform a genetic takeover with the blockchain ecosystem of the current system. So I think one reason why the mainstream adoption of secure computing is delayed is that the overall ecosystem that we have is not hostile enough. So companies, big companies that we already have and institutions, they can be successful even though they're implementing their systems in architecture that is not secure, right? They're just rich enough to be able to stuff the loopholes in security without ever really having to build on secure infrastructure. But a counterexample to this is Ethereum's current approach, right? So both Bitcoin and Ethereum are evolving in an ecosystem that is very hostile, right? It relies on very hostile attack pressures. The best example is the 2016 DAO hack, right? where uh, a lot of million got diverted because the application that was built on top of Ethereum was not inherently secure. So I think when insecurity leads to losses of this size, then players have, or, and, and players have no really insurance recourse mechanism for compensation, then these losses are real, right? And of course, everyone has heard of the hard fork, right? But I think that, and I thought this was actually an, an unfortunate decision to do because I think that the hostility that would be in the system would actually breed more secure systems if people would know that losses are real if they don't build secure foundations. So I think the security of most blockchain projects that I'm seeing have kind of as security as a kind of like integral part of their value proposition. And so these systems are evolving with like a degree of natural adversarial attack testing that is not present in the current ecosystem because they often have like million dollar bug bounties, right? And, and if you can actually hack them. Um, and I think that if these um, blockchain systems that we currently see, they are, you know, like in this blockchain ecosystem, the ones that are not bulletproof are killed really early and visibly. And so that the ecosystem over time, I think will remain populated only by so, the so far bulletproof systems. Bitcoin is still around because it has been pretty successful or pretty, or at least relatively safe to other systems, right? So I think that these projects in the blockchain space could really provide like the seed of a system that can survive a magnitude of cyber attacks that is much larger than the current ecosystem of companies that we're currently building on. And if this is the case, and if, we, if there was um, the hope for the blockchain ecosystem being a viable alternative to the current system that we create companies with, we might perform such something like a genetic takeover where the system gets so competitive and grows inside the current system that it eventually takes over naturally. Um, so this is, if you're interested more in this topic, um, there's more technical stuff on, that, on the blockchain ecosystem as a role model for AI safety in the paper um, that I referenced in the decentralized approaches to AI, cyber, and nanosecurity. And then finally, Cooperation is a hard one here, right? Because the system is decentralized, you have many players that have to cooperate. And um, here our idea is kind of like, we wanna ultimately right, um, provide general AI services without one AGI-centered entity, but with this decentralized network multitude of different intelligent agents. So the main problem that you might be seeing, well, there's this first move advantage, right? There's always, it's always gonna be more kind of valuable to have one centralized AI the, or AGI rather than many multiply like distributed AI, AI systems, right? And I do think that's a valuable opposition, but I think that if the system that we're supposing is really good, then the marginal utility that um, of providing these AI systems centrally is potentially small, right? And I think it relies on this kind of base that 
Um, it's a, a paper, a really good paper. Um, well, it's more an index of papers written by uh, Eric Drexler on distilled intelligence. That's, a, I think, maybe an interesting technical approach to this. But it ultimately assumes that AI research right now is advancing via this, distribu this distributed research and development environment where these R&D tasks can incrementally be automated and it's more open source. And so looking forward along those paths, you might be saying that you have these like really rapid AI-enabled AI technology improvements that would ultimately not require engineering one central AI, but that would be good enough to provide the services in itself. And I think this system scales to super intelligent level AI technologies, hopefully, so that the services that we would want the AGI as a central entity to provide can be provided in a way, in a decentralized way, that the you know the instrumental value of creating one centralized agent uh, agent is um is, is neglected can, can be neglected. This is kind of like a quick way of how we would solve like the four different um I think problem domains. If you're interested in this, this is the paper Cyber Nano AGI risk decentralized approaches to reducing risk. It's on the index. I'm linking from it. It's published under Google Research right now. Um, and we have an AGI safety meeting coming up in San Francisco at the Internet Archive, um, which will discuss corporations as AGI. That's a paper by Peter Shire that's on the um, list. But we will also be touching on this civilization as superintelligence there. Um, if you're interested in learning more about this, um, if you're interested in, if you think that there's different um, angles that you have good good um, good research on, then contact me at a at foresight.org. Um, and ultimately, right, we have to make it happen. So we do accept USD, but we also accept um, cryptocurrencies. Um, and since this is a blockchain-based theory, um, we're hoping that there is um, at least sufficient um, sufficient incentive um, to really to really fund those projects because I think they are important also for the blockchain space. Um, anyways, if you're interested in that intersection between AI safety and blockchain, that might be an important one. Ultimately, though, however. There's a lot to do, right? So I think there's three different things that you could be doing if you're interested in this field. One is go to the index on existentialhope.com and read up on AI and cybersecurity. I think that's the least that everyone can do, right? This is a topic that everyone has to be educated on. Then donate to the nonprofits listed. If you like our approach, consider donating to Foresight, consider getting more involved. There's, membership, um, there's a membership opportunity too. And then the third one is really just go into the field and do it yourself, right? That's the reason why I've like listed the four areas is I think to break it up so that people can see where they might have an, an individual corporate like co comparative advantage in the areas. Those are all of the different grants and fellowships that are out in the field right now in terms of ethics, in terms of alignment, cybersecurity policy. There's a lot of opening positions right now, different to foresight, <laughs> like to my nonprofit. Many of the um, AI safety organizations are not strapped for cash anymore. They are now really strapped for talent. So Miri is hiring a bunch of, um, has a bunch of opening positions in the technical alignment space. FLI is giving out grants. Odd, like the nonprofit has opening positions. There's the AI alignment prize. In terms of cybersecurity, there's an open tech fund. In terms of policy, there's a new um, prize that is by Good AI. Future of Life Institute is searching for an open AI policy researcher, even though they might have filled their position now. Open Philanthropy has opening positions. The UK government has opening positions. And you can join Foresight. The fellowship is closed right now, but if you would like, there's still the seminar on AGI's corporations. It's on April, 7, uh, on April 8, not April 7, at the Internet Archive. So by all means, um, join all of those efforts. Because I think ultimately what's different to the Disney like uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice quote, they're short in the, in the beginning, there is no master, right? There is no master, there's no sorcerer that can ultimately help the apprentice. It's just us, really. We are trying to figure this out. Like with us, it's, I don't know, just mean foresight, I mean we as humans. There's no master that can help us, to that can come to help. Elon Musk's wizard head with Neuralink will not be done, I think, in time for us to not at least be thinking about these issues. We are the apprentices without a master. We're the first ones actually doing this, to our knowledge. Maybe in some other multiverse there's others, but who knows, to our best knowledge, we are the only ones. And I think there's a lot to be done, right? But I think ultimately it's also incredibly exciting, right? Because I think if we get this right, 
then we don't just become masters, but because we could potentially become much more than that. Because we don't deal with brooms, but we deal with intelligences, right? <laughs> so I think these intelligences ultimately can instruct a lot about our own intelligence as well, right? If we get this right, we can update our own ethics, right? We might create systems that are less biased than us, that can teach us about morality, that can create these insane scientific breakthroughs, that can ultimately maybe even al allow us to have this type of complexity of experience that we cannot even fathom right now, just like an ant cannot fathom the types of experiences that we can have. So I think if we ultimately get this right, we face a future that is really beautiful, complex, and intelligent beyond imagination. So I really think we should get this right. There's a lot of interesting fields to be working on. Please go on the index on existentialhope.com, see if there's anything that you think you can contribute to in terms of monetary resources, your brain, or just by reading up on the different areas. Um, thank you so much for coming to this talk. I know it's been um, quite a... Um, quite an intense two hours and I appreciate you sticking it out. I think this is, is, is really important and it's a really complex problem um, but I think ultimately if we get it right um, it can be really good. <laughs> so thanks a lot.